How many of you were here last year? Okay, what if you, how many are, are new? It's the first DEF CON. Nice, so for all of you that are new, the rest already know, um, Olaf and I have this, this fight, right? He thinks that the people that come to DEF CON are introverts. And we obviously kind of let him out, get away with that, right? So, again, I did it last year, but he's still not sure. I think it was not enough. I was watching the videos, and yeah, I was so-so. So I, I, want him, I want you guys to show him how not an introvert you guys are with a very big ovation to Olaf. Come on. No, no doubt this time. I don't even have to repeat it this time. <laughs> so thanks a lot, guys. So we are very excited. One more year uh, at DEF CON, very ready to, to show you tons and tons of very cool stuff we've been working on. And I, I actually wanted to, to tie everything that Tim has said. By the way, Tim, thanks a lot for accepting our invitation to come. It's, it's an honor for us. With what you're going to be seeing during the rest of the week. And in particular, how in Library 7, we've embraced this concept of modularity and how we fall in love with it. So let's take a step back, though, and, and think, why does, it ma does this matter now? I mean, we've had modularity for a while in different ways, right? It's, it's nothing completely new. But the reason why it's becoming more and more relevant is because not just the development world is, is, making some, is going through some changes. It's the whole world that is actually completely changing in front of us. So even the very traditional businesses, like hotels, like taxis, like going to the supermarket, which we were not expecting them to change anytime soon, are being completely disrupted because guess what? Everybody has a smartphone except for my friend Thomas, which I just learned he hasn't won yet. Um, but everybody else has a smartphone, right? So why, why do you have to go to the store? Why do you have to wait on a line to check in on a hotel or, or wait for a taxi? As soon as you, find, uh, as you try these new experiences, everything changes. But it's not only about the smartphones, right? All industries are either being disrupted or about to be disrupted. Even if you go to Disney World, now, I haven't gone to Disney World, but I, I've been told, you, you get this bracelet. And if you're a kid and you pass by this picture of Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse says, hey, Jorge, it's kind of creepy, but it's also awesome, right? And it allows you to do so many things. That picture over there is very nice. I got it from, from Brian Song. And it's actually just a field. I don't know if it's a cornfield or some other type of cereal. Now, what you see up there, a little bit smaller, that's a drone. And you know, if it's a drone, it's cool. You guys, you guys know it, right? Uh, but not only that, this is even cooler because it's taking pictures of the cornfield and it's letting the farmer know which parts of that cornfield uh, is actually healthy and which are not. This is happening right now, and this revolution is, is just beginning. So what's in it for us? The thing is, that's great news for developers, right? Because not, not only there will be many more jobs, uh, but there's going to be really cool things to do out there. But uh, with, with you know, great power comes great responsibility. And this is also going to involve big new challenges. Big new challenges, sometimes of the type that we, we hate the most. Right? Because there will be lots of opportunities there, but only for those that are able to move really fast. And, and you know what that means, right? If previously we were able to launch a new service in a few months and be super happy and have our bosses, our customers super happy, now they will be required to be able to deploy new features, new services, completely new things in weeks or even in days. Right? And unless we also change the way we develop our systems, this is just not going to be possible, or it's going to happen under a lot of stress. 
So this is one of the reasons why we need to rethink how we build systems. And, and we need to find a way of doing that in a healthy way so that we can get the benefits of this cool new world that we're getting into. So if you've paid any attention to Team World, you obviously know what we think the solution is, right? And just in case he didn't make it clear enough, I, I want to I wanna quickly recap uh, why, why this is the solution, right? And obviously, we can just take a look at nature where we can find the most complex systems, and it's all built of patterns. And Tim has been talking about Lego, and, and how with Lego, built of small pieces, you can build really, really, really complicated things. But I don't think he's, he showed it enough. He only showed this in two of his slides. You can actually build a Millennium Falcon. How cool is that, right? OK, maybe not that cool. So actually, the one slide that I, I really want to remind you and, and emphasize from Tim's presentation is the one in which he showed the microchip. The microchip actually completely revolutionized how electronic systems are built. There were modules before, but at one point, they really understood how the power of building these systems out of these reusable modules was immense. And if we were able to go back in the past and bring someone working on electronics back then, and we showed them the type of electronic systems that we are building today, they would not believe it. Right? And one other thing I like about this picture uh, is we see a few chips there. But what, what's taking most of the picture? Who dares to answer that? It's easy, right? Anyone? Come on, Pierre, you always answer. Oh, over here. Connections, right? And that's something very, very important that Tim also emphasized. Modules are just as important as their communications among each other, how you connect them, how you're able to connect them in a way that it's uncoupled, as Tim mentioned. So I believe that we are right now in the software world where the electronics world was when the microchip was invented, when the microchip became popular. There were modules before, of course. We were using Maven Central, as Tim said. We were doing our own modules. That's fine. But now is when we are starting to get ready to start a revolution to match the digital transformation that we are seeing in the, in the outside world. So as a proof of that, I, I want to talk about some trends that we're seeing in the enterprise world. You may be wondering if this applies, and the answer is obviously yes. And I'm going to talk about some trends that have become increasingly popular, right? Tim already mentioned one, microservices. The OSDI community has been talking about microservices for years. However, they've only really become popular since last year when uh, Netflix published these papers about how they do things with microservices. So I want to ask you a question. How many of you know what a microservice is? So I see like 10, 15 hands. How many of you have developed a microservice and put it in production? OK, same guy from yesterday. So you're very brave. And a couple of other guys over here. So, a microservice is actually a very simple idea. A microservice is just a small, independent, and composable service. That does one thing. So let's, let's explain what this means. A small means, it's, at first it was interpreted actually as number of lines of code. It should be very few lines of code. Uh, as the concept has matured, people have learned that it's not so much about the number of lines of code, but about how focused it is in doing what it says on the right, one thing properly. It's independent. What this means is that it can be developed independently and it can be deployed independently. That's a very important part. That's exactly what allows us to move fast. And then it's composable. And here's where we go 
back again to the communications. You need to be able, just like we did with Lego pieces, just like we did with microchips, to build more complex systems out of small pieces and then build even more complex systems uh, out of the uh, first uh, components that we build from the smaller pieces. So this is, this is one example, and, and this is getting very, very popular. Uh, but not only in the back-end world, we see an increasing trend towards modularity. In the front-end world, we're seeing that too. In fact, what we're seeing with this increase in importance in the user experience is that the way of building awesome user experiences is also becoming modular. Uh, probably most of you have heard about material design and how Google was able to provide it to Android developers and improve the user experience of almost all apps built for Android in a very short time. Android before this was significantly harder to use. The user experience was significantly harder than for iOS, for example. And thanks to this modular approach in building uh, user interfaces, they've been able to turn that upside down. And actually, this idea is being adopted at higher levels. So you probably, or few of you have probably heard of atomic design. It's most well known within the, the UX community. But basically, it's a more abstract idea about this exact concept, how you need to build, or how the proposal is to build user experiences, not only UIs, from atoms that form molecules, that form organisms, and then because this is in the context of websites usually, templates and pages. So does it sound familiar? Isn't it the exact same thing we're talking about? The more complicated systems we need to build, the more we end up getting back to this concept. Even JavaScript needs to evolve. And the version that was just released this year, ECMAScript 2015, it was renamed before the release, has one feature that allows JavaScript developers to build JavaScript from modules, import modules, import different parts of, of those modules, and compose a more complex system thanks to that. So what are our key takeaways? What can we learn both from systems that have existed long before and from these trends that we are seeing in the software world? Number one, if you really want to be able to move fast while you keep the stability that we will also need in all, in all software systems, we need to embrace this idea of being able to develop small modules that are independent that can be developed separately from other modules, that can be deployed independently, and that can be evolved independently. Number two, you need to be able to combine those pieces together, because otherwise, you won't build anything meaningful. And very particular for software, we think that reusability is a big part. Just like when building an electronic circuit, it would be insane to build it from scratch. The same is true for software. And in order to be able to reuse, obviously usage of standards is super important. And another factor that is super important is to be able to build components, these modules that we've been talking about, in a way that they are customizable. And these are the three things that define the way we interpret modularity at LifeRay and what we've tried to embrace during the last years. So, the question is, OK, this all sounds very nice, but that's kind of tough, right? And, and the truth is, is, it is. There are a lot of challenges. For example, microservices is getting very popular. Everybody's saying you should do microservices. And if you look at the articles out there, most of them talk about a variety of microservices that was popularized by, by Netflix and, and other big giants, uh, in which each microservice is in its own process. And that obviously brings some challenges. So first, it's a new development paradigm, completely new development paradigm. And that's good to a certain extent, but the larger the shift is, the harder it, is, it will be for developers to be able to adapt or to adapt soon enough. But there are lots of communication challenges, right? If, if these microservices are in, in different processes, then 
how do you, how do they find each other without coupling with each other? Um, should we use RPC? That seems to be the simplest, but then again, you have much more coupling. So we use REST. You have a lot more decoupling, but then it's, the latency gets kind of kind of big, right? So we cannot afford it. So now people are talking about binary protocols and, and so on. Then should the communication be synchronous or asynchronous? Um, so synchronous is probably might, might be faster, but then what if one microservice falls down? They are separate process. So there are lots of challenges. And obviously, if each microservice is a separate process, the operation gets, gets much harder. You need to orchestrate our systems. And there are super cool tools that are coming up to facilitate these things, uh, like containers or, or things like Kubernetes to manage those containers. But it's really a challenge. Right? And you may end up like this. Right? So of, yeah, we now have microservices. So now, now what? Right. The communication side is, is really the big, the big challenge here. There are also challenges on the JavaScript front. Like, yeah, it's out, but no browser supported. For design languages, OK, it's going in that trend, but how do I use it? That does not apply to me. So the question that I wanted to get to is, how can LiveRay help apply these ideas now? And that's basically what we've been working on as we've built LiveRay 7. The goal of Library 7, one of the main goals at least, is to be able to put modularity at your fingertips. And actually, we started this even before Library 7, and part of, part of this is already available in, in 6.2. So what does Library 7 provide? First, it leverages OSGI, as Tim was, was saying, to allow you to build microservices now. Not any kind of microservices, to be honest, but the one we think is most useful for most cases, which is in-VM microservices. And one of the great things of in-VM microservices, and especially if they are based on, on uh, a really nice standard, such as the OSDI family of standards, is that it provides a registry and a communication mechanism to communicate without decoupling all those microservices. And it has a powerful, very powerful, I can speak for experience, and you'll see it during these two days, customizability model, which increments reuse a lot. So what does that look like? It's actually incredibly simple. So this is a microservice. So I have to warn you, this requires some uh, mindset change, but not that difficult to understand. Basically. With OSEI, with Library 7, and also to a certain degree with 6.2, you can build microservices just by using one annotation. And you can consume other microservices just by using another annotation. The first one is add component, the second one is add reference. And you can declare dependencies very simply just with a, a configuration file where you declare what your module, which is a jar file with one or more microservices, needs, and what it is exporting. Right? So it gets really, really simple. Not only on the backend side, we've embraced modularity, also in the JavaScript side. Imagine you could use ECMAScript 6, ECMAScript 2015 now. That's something that thanks to the guys of the front end team in Library. This is going to be possible, starting with, with Library 7. You can develop using ECMAScript 2015 as if you were in the future, and it's going to be automatically transpiled into the versions of JavaScript that the browsers most popular out there really support. And this includes the hardest part, which is not really related to, to uh, code syntax or anything like that. And it's actually the most important part for us, which is to be able to load those modules that you ha are declaring directly in your JavaScript file dynamically. We've built a module loader uh, in in within Library 7 that allows you to use this feature of JavaScript today. So this is basically, if you haven't seen it yet, the way you will be able to import modules or parts, as in the second example of, of modules. 
uh, in, in JavaScript 6 or ECMAScript 2015. And this is already possible with Library 7 if you download the, the alpha version. And of course, one of the benefits of being able to, to use a platform like Liferay is that we've made a huge effort during the last uh, couple of years, even three years, to take many of the features that Liferay as a platform already provides and turn them into modules so that it's much easier for your own developments to pick and choose whatever features you want, customize them, because now they are more extensible than ever before, and be able to build your systems out of these Lego pieces. So, Basically, this idea of customization applies to Liferay. That's a big change, because previously, Liferay was more or less customizable. It was more or less replaceable. But it was very hard to build something that was as customizable outside of Liferay. Now everything is, is even. And many, many, many features of Liferay have been converted into microservices. And one big benefit is that you can replace them with your own, super simply. And many things that you wouldn't think they can be a microservice, they can actually, uh, we've actually made it so that they behave as if they were. That includes from taglib use. You can take almost any taglib at Liferay and deal with it as if it was a microservice and change the implementation or change the view. Uh, we have a new product navigation, and each of those items behave as if they were a microservice. This is possible because as Tim was saying, with OSEI, microservices or turtles go all the way down. They can be really as small as you want. And image selector, that's something that, that Sergio is going to show you later, a, a cool new image selector, is also a good example of turning even the view into this concept of, of components or microservices. So all of Library 7, and not only Library 7, but the things we're building around it are being built with a modular mindset. Library Lexicon is um, a user experience language that we are developing in-house for our own applications, that, but that might be useful for you. And Juan Hidalgo is going to present it uh, during this event. And it's built with that same mindset. Library screens, you probably already know about library screens. And if not, that's a very, very cool project that is Getting, gaining a lot of popularity that allows you to build mobile applications that are native, but are built, again, from components, and that allows you to build in a much more modular and faster way. We are switching from many years user and to building many small modules for Gradle and Maven, so that in our case, we're switching to Gradle, but regardless of whether you're using Gradle or Maven, you can benefit from these small modules instead of just having to pick this monolith that uh, used to be the, the plugin SDK, which, by the way, in case you're worried, will still work. Metal.js is a new library uh, that we are building to allow building small modules to uh, or leverage this idea of, of modules or even micro-modules in the JavaScript world and make them compatible, for example, with, with jQuery. And in this event, later today, I think it's the last session, we are presenting a new project that also embraces this idea, which is called Launchpad. So I just want to finish with some final words. Based on our own experience in this journey towards modularity in the last few years, the first one is, if you can avoid it, please, at all costs, don't develop monoliths anymore. It is a huge pain to break the monolith. Right? It takes much more effort than, than it seems. However, once you do it, you're in love with it. And you want to stay in front of hundreds of people telling them, don't develop monoliths anymore. Right? Uh, so obviously, that's easier said than done. You, fortunately, don't need to upgrade to Library 7, although we hope you do, to benefit from this. There are many technologies that you can use right now. Uh, we have an OSGI engine in 6.2 already that you can leverage. And actually, all this targeting has is, is been following this concept since, since the very beginning and runs on, on Library 6.2. If you have a previous version, it's also possible it will require some more work. But 
believe me, it's really worth it. And if you are like us, and you have existing monoliths, then it's not easy. Take it uh, step by step, take it gradually. But one of the awesome things of what we've learned is that and the technologies that we are actually leveraging is that you can actually do it like that. You can do it a small step at a time. You can keep your monolith and then extract the small things out, make them OSDI modules, and everything will keep working as usual. The more you extract out, the more benefits you'll get. And of course, don't build from scratch. Reuse. Think microchips. Okay. We need to start building complex systems, like electronic systems, build their own. The more we develop, the harder it is to maintain and evolve those systems. That doesn't mean you don't develop, but try to develop with this idea of modularity and reusability in mind. Try to make what you develop a module. Try to think, how can I make it so that it's, through configuration or customizability, reusable in as many scenarios as possible. And of course, learn about Life 7 and this is the best place in the world to learn about Life Race 7. And you're surrounded by people who know a lot about it, right? So I didn't have room for all of them. But look at these faces, at least try to remember a few. And if you look at them, you can tell them, tell me about Life Race 7. Or you can just attend their talks. So I cannot name them all, but following this presentation, you will have two awesome talks that will dig deeper into some of the concepts that I've been introducing. One of them is Ray Oye, over there, upper right corner, who is going to talk about how all this idea of my NVM microservices and the modularity that comes with OSDI is a developer's dream. And Sema, over here, he's going to do a similar talk, but oriented towards front-end developers and telling you how we are trying to bring all these modern or even futuristic web technologies, like I mentioned ECMAScript 2015, so that all front-end developers can use them in LifeRace 7. So thanks a lot, and I hope you enjoy the event.